Welcome to Classic Paranormal, where we bring you true stories of the weird, strange, and otherworldly from works of literature from the past that time forgot. Don't forget to hit the share button to help promote this podcast. In this second episode, you will be entertained by Elsa Barker's Letters from a Living Dead Man, first published in 1919. Letter 16. A Thing to be Forgotten. I want to say a word to those who are about to die. I want to beg them to forget their bodies as soon as possible after the change which they call death. Oh, the terrible curiosity to go back and look upon the thing which we once believed to be ourselves. The thought comes to us now and then so powerfully that it acts in a way against our will and draws us back to it. With some it is a morbid obsession, and many cannot get free from it while there remains a shred of flesh on the bones which they once leaned upon. Tell them to forget it altogether, to force the thought away, to go out into the other life free. Looking back upon the past is sometimes good, but not upon this relic of the past. It is so easy to look into the coffin, because the body which we wear now is a awful light in a dark place, and it can penetrate grosser matter. I have been back myself a few times, but am determined to go back no more. Yet someday the thought may come to me again with compelling insistence to see how it is getting on. I do not want to shock or pain you, only to warn you. It is sad to see the sight which inevitably meets one in the grave. That may be the reason why many souls who have not been here long are so melancholy. They return again and again to the place which they should not visit. You know that out here if we think intently of a place we are apt to find ourselves there. The body which we use is so light that it can follow thought almost without effort. Tell them not to do it. One day, while walking down an avenue of trees, for we have trees here, I met a tall woman in a long black garment. She was weeping, for we have tears here also. I asked her why she wept, and she turned to me eyes of unutterable sadness. I have been back to it, she said. My heart ached for her, because I knew how she felt. The shock of the first visit is repeated each time, as the thing one sees is less and less what we like to think of ourselves as being. Often I remember that tall woman in black walking down the avenue of trees and weeping. It is partly curiosity that draws us back, partly magnetic attraction. But it can do no good. It is better to forget it. I have sometimes longed, from sheer scientific interest, to ask my boy Lionel if he had been back to his body. But I have not asked him for fear of putting the idea into his mind. He has such a restless curiosity. Perhaps those who go out as children have less of that morbid instinct than we have. If we could only remember in life that the form which we call ourselves is not our real immortal self at all, we would not give it such an exaggerated importance, though we would nevertheless take needful care of it. As a rule, those who say they have been long here do not seem old. I asked the teacher why, and he said that after a time an old person forgets that he is old, that the tendency is to grow young in thought and therefore young in appearance, that the body tends to take the form which we hold of it in our minds, that the law of rhythm works here as elsewhere. Children grow up out here, and they may even go on to a sort of old age if that is the expectation of the mind. But the tendency is to keep the prime, to go forward or backward to the best period, and then to hold that until the irresistible attraction of the earth asserts itself again. Most of the men and women here do not know that they have lived many times in flesh. They remember their latest life more or less vividly, but all before that seems like a dream. One should always keep the memory of the past as clear as possible. It helps one to construct the future. Those people who think of their departed friends as being all wise, how disappointed they would be if they could know that the life on this side is only an extension of the life on earth. If the thoughts and desires there have been only for material pleasures, the thoughts and desires here are likely to be the same. I have met veritable saints since coming out, but they are men and women who held in earth life the saintly ideal and who are now free to live it. Life can be so free here. There is none of that machinery of living which makes people on earth such slaves. In our world, a man is held only by his thoughts. If they are free, he is free. Few, though, are of my philosophic spirit. There are more saints here than philosophers, as the highest ideal of most persons when intensely active has been towards the religious rather than the philosophic life. I think the happiest people I have met on this side have been the painters. Our matter is so light and subtle and so easily handled that it falls readily into the forms of the imagination. There are beautiful pictures here. Some of our artists try to impress their pictures upon the mental eyes of the artists of Earth and they often succeed in doing so. There is joy in the heart of one of our real artists when a fellow craftsman on your side catches an idea from him and puts it into execution. He may not always be able to see how clearly well the second man works out the idea, for it requires a special gift or a special training to see from one form of matter into the other. 
but the inspiring spirit catches the thought of the inspired one's mind and knows that a conception of his own is being executed upon the earth. With poets, it is the same. There are lovely lyrics composed out here and impressed upon the receptive minds of earthly poets. A poet told me that it was easier to do that with a short lyric than with an epic or a drama, where a long-continued effort was necessary. It is much the same with musicians. Whenever you go to a concert where beautiful music is being played, there is probably all around you a crowd of music-loving spirits drinking in the harmonies. Music on earth is much enjoyed on this side. It can be heard. But no sensitive spirit likes to go near a place where bad strumming is going on. We prefer the music of stringed instruments. Of all earthly things, sound reaches most directly into this plane of life. Tell that to the musicians. If they could only hear our music. I did not understand music on earth, but now my ears are becoming adjusted. It seems sometimes as if you must hear our music over there as we hear yours. You may have wondered how I spend my time and where I go. There is a lovely spot in the country which I never tire of visiting. It is on the side of a mountain, not far from my own city. There is a little road winding round a hill, and just above the road is a hut, a roofed enclosure with the lower side open. Sometimes I stay there for hours and listen to the rippling of the brook which runs beside the road. The tall slender trees have become like brothers to me. At first I cannot see the material trees very clearly, but I go into the little hut which is made of fresh clean boards with a sweet smell, and I lie down on a shelf or bunk along the wall. Then I close my eyes, and by an effort, or no, it is not what I would call an effort, but a sort of drifting, I can see the beautiful place. But you must know that this is in the nighttime there, and I see it by the light of myself. That is why we travel in the dark part of the twenty-four hours, for in the bright sunlight we cannot see at all. Our light is put out by the cruder light of the sun. One night I took the boy Lionel there with me, leaving him in the hut while I went a little distance away. Looking back, I saw the whole hut illuminated by a lovely radiance, the radiance of Lionel himself. The little building, which has a peaked roof, looked like a pearl lighted from within. It was a beautiful experience. I then went to Lionel and told him to go on his turn a little distance away while I took his place in the hut. I was curious to know if he would see the same phenomenon when I lay there. If I could shed such light through dense matter, the boards of the building. When I called him to me afterwards and asked if he had seen anything strange, he said, What a wonderful man you are, Father. How did you make that hut seem to be on fire? Then I knew that he had seen the same thing I had seen. But I am tired now and can write no more. Good night, and may you have pleasant dreams. Letter 17 The Second Wife Over There I am often called upon here to decide matters for others. Many people call me simply the judge, but we bear as a rule the name that we last bore on earth. Men and women come to me to settle all sorts of questions for them, questions of ethics, questions of expediency, even quarrels. Did you suppose that no one quarreled here? Many do. There are even long-standing feuds among them. The holders of different opinions on religion are often hot in their arguments. Coming here with the same beliefs they had on earth and being able to visualize their ideals and actually to experience the things they are expecting. Two men who hold opposite creeds forcibly are each more intolerant than ever before. Each is certain that he is right and that the other is wrong. This stubbornness of belief is strongest with those who have been here only a short time. After a while, they fall into a larger tolerance, living their own lives more and more and enjoying the world of proofs and realizations which each soul builds for itself. But I want to give you an illustration of the sort of question on which I am asked to pass judgment. There are two women here who in life were both married to one man, though not at the same time. The first woman died, then the man married again, and soon, not more than a year or two after, the man and his second wife both came out. The first wife considers herself the man's only wife, and she follows him about everywhere. She says that he promised to meet her in heaven. He is more inclined to the second wife, though he still feels affection for wife number one. He is rather impatient at what he calls unreasonableness. He told me one day that he would gladly give them both up if he could be left in peace to carry out certain studies in which he is interested. They were among the people I met soon after I began to be strong myself here. It was not so very long ago, and the man sought my society so much that the women, in order to be near him, have come along too. One day, all three came to me and propounded their question, or rather, wife number one propounded it. She said, This man is my husband. Should not therefore this woman go far away and leave him altogether to me? I asked wife number two what she had to say. Her answer was that she would be all alone here but for her husband and that she had had him last. He now belonged more to her than to the other. In a flash, the memory came to me of those Sadducees who propounded a similar question to Christ, and I quoted his answer as nearly as I could remember it. 
that when they shall rise from the dead, they neither marry nor are given in marriage, but are as the angels which are in heaven. My answer was as much a staggerer for them as their question had been for me, and they went away to think about it. When they were gone, I began myself to ponder the question. I had already observed that whether or not all here are as the angels in heaven, there does not seem to be a good deal of mating and rejoining of former mates. The sex distinction is as real here as on earth, though of course its expression is not exactly the same. I asked myself a good many questions which perhaps would never have occurred to me but for the troubles of this interesting triad, and I thought of the man I had somewhere read about who said that he never knew his own opinion of anything until he tried to express it to somebody. After a while, the three came to me again and said that they had been talking things over, perhaps after the manner of angels in heaven. For wife number one told me that she had decided to let her husband spend a part of his time with the other woman if he wanted to. Now, the man had a sweetheart, a girl sweetheart, before he had either of his wives. The girl is out here somewhere, and the man often has a strong desire to try to find her. What opportunity he will now have to do so, I cannot say. The situation is rather depressing for the poor fellow. It is bad enough to have one person who insists on every minute of your society without having two, and I think his case is not unusual. Perhaps the only way in which he can get free from his two insistent companions is by going back to the earth. There is a way, however, by which he could secure solitude, but he does not know of it. A man who knows how can isolate himself here as well as he could on earth. He can build round himself a wall which only the eyes of a great initiate can pierce. I have not told this secret to my friend, but perhaps I shall someday if it seems necessary for his development that he should have a little solitude. At present, it seems to me that he will learn more from adjusting to this double claim and trying to find the truth that lies in it. Perhaps he may learn that really, essentially, fundamentally, he does not belong to either of these women. The souls out here seem to belong to themselves, and after the first few years, they get to love liberty so much that they are ready to yield a little of their claim upon others. This is a great place in which to grow if one really wants to grow, though few persons take advantage of its possibilities. Most are content to assimilate the experiences they had on earth. It would be depressing to one who did not realize that will is free to see how souls let slip their opportunities here even as they did on the moon-guarded planet. There are teachers here who stand ready to help anyone who wishes their help in making real and deep studies in the mysteries of life, the life here, the life there, and in the remote past. If a man understands that his recent sojourn on earth was merely the latest in a long series of lives, and if he concentrates his mind towards recovering the memories of the distant past, he can recover them. Some persons may think that the mere dropping of the veil of matter should free the soul from all obscuration. But as on earth, so out here, things are not thus and so because they ought to be, but because they are. We draw to ourselves the experiences which we are ready for and which we demand. And most souls do not demand enough here any more than they did in life. Tell them to demand more, and the demand will be answered. Letter 18. Individual Hells Some time ago I told you of my intention to visit hell. But when I began investigations on that line, there proved to be many hells. Each man who is not content with the orthodox hell of fire and brimstone builds one out of mind stuff suited to his imaginative need. I believe that men place themselves in hell, that no god puts them there. I began looking for a hell of fire and brimstone and found it. Dante must have seen the same things I saw. But there are other and individual hells. The writing suddenly stopped for no apparent reason and was not continued that night. Letter 19. A Little Home in Heaven I have met a very interesting man since last I wrote to you. He is a lover who for ten years waited here for his love to come to him. They said on earth that he was dead, and they urged her to love another. But she could not forget him, for every night he met her soul in dreams, every night she came out here to him, and sometimes she could recall on waking all that he had said to her in sleep. She had told him that she would not delay long in the sunshine world, but would come out to him in the self-lighted world. Only a little while ago she came. He had been long getting ready for her coming and had built in the substance of this world the little home he had planned to build for her in the outer world. He told me how one night when she came to him in dreams, she said that she would rejoin him on the morrow, never to leave him again. He was startled and would almost have stayed her, because he had died a sudden and painful death and he dreaded pain for her. Always he had watched over her, warning her of danger. But this time he felt, after the first shock of the message was over, that she was really coming, and he was very happy. He had found no other love out here, for when one leaves the earth full of great affection and when the earthly loved one does not forget, the tie can hold for many years unweakened. You on the earth have forgotten so much of what you have learned here that you do not realize how your thought of us can make us happy, 
do not realize how your forgetfulness of us can throw us back entirely upon ourselves. Often those who go farthest here, who really grow in spirituality, are those whose loves have forgotten them on earth. But it is sad to be forgotten nevertheless. It is a bitter power you make possible to us when you throw us back upon ourselves. And not all souls are strong enough or aspiring enough to make use of the lonely impetus that might help them to scale the ladder of spiritual knowledge. But to return to my lovers, all that day he remained near her. He would not rest. For as I have told you, we generally rest a little when the sun shines on the earth. All that day he remained near her. He could not see her body, for the rays of sunlight were too strong for him. But after hours of waiting, suddenly he felt a hand in his, and though she was invisible to him, yet he knew she was here. And he spoke to her, using such words as he would have used on earth. She did not seem to understand. He spoke again, and still she did not answer. But he knew from the pressure of her hand that she realized his presence. So hand in hand, there they stood in the darkness of the sunlight, the man able to speak because of his long experience in this world of subtle sounds, the woman speechless and bewildered, but still clinging to his hand. When the sunshine went away, he was able to see her face, and her eyes were wide and frightened, but still she seemed held to the room in which the body lay, which had been she. It was summer, and the windows were open. He sought to draw her away into the perfumed night which to them was day, but she held his hand and would not let him go. At last he drew her away a short distance and spoke to her again. Now she heard and answered, Beloved, she said, which is I? For I see myself, I feel myself back there also. I seem to be in two places. Which I is really I? He comforted her with loving words. He was still afraid to caress her, for the touch of souls is very keen, and he feared lest she should go back into the form which seemed to be so near them, and thus be lost to him again. But though she had often come to him in dreams, it had not been so vividly as this time, and he felt that she had really passed through the great change. She still clung to his hand, yet seemed afraid to go out with him, out and away from it. He stayed there with her all night and all the next day when the darkening sun came again, and again he could not see her. Once the well-meaning friends of his beloved disturbed her body, doing those sacred offices which seem so necessary to the living but which may sorely disturb the dead. He stayed with her the second night and all the second day. He could hear the sobs of her grieving parents, though they could not see either him or their daughter. But on the second night, the little dog of his love came into the room where it lay, the room in which their two souls still stood and the little dog saw them and whined piteously. The man could hear it, and she could also hear it. And now she could hear him more plainly when he spoke to her. Where will they take it, she asked. He recalled the time when he had been held spellbound near his own lifeless form over which his loved one had shed bitter tears. And he asked her if it would not be better to come away together. But she could not, or thought she could not. On the third day, he knew from the agitation of his love that they were placing her body in the coffin. After a while, he felt, though he could not see, that many other persons were in the room, and he heard mournful music. Music can reach from one world to another, can be heard far more plainly than human voices which generally cannot be heard at all except by the trained listener. By and by, his love was sorely agitated, and he also, through sympathy with her, and they felt themselves going slowly, oh so slowly along, and he said to her, Do not be grieved. They are taking it to the burial. But you are safe with me. He knew that she was much troubled. It is not for nothing that over the house of death there always hangs a strange hush, not to be explained by the mere losing of the loved one. Those who remain behind feel, though they cannot see, the soul of the one who has gone out. Their souls are full of sympathy for him in his bewilderment. The change need not be painful if one would only remember that it has been passed through before, but one so easily forgets. We sometimes call the earth the valley of forgetfulness. During the days and weeks that followed, this lover remained with his loved one, even trying to draw her away from the earth and from it, which had for her, as for so many, a fearsome fascination. It is said that the souls of those who have lived long on earth more easily detach themselves. But this woman was still young, only about thirty, and even with the help of her lover, it was little time before she could get free. But one day, or night as you would say, he showed her her home which he had built for her, and it was literally a mansion in the sky. She entered with him, and it became their home. Sometimes he leaves her for a little while, or she leaves him, for the joy of being together is heightened here as on earth by an occasional separation, but not until she was content and accustomed to the new life did he leave her at all. During the first few days, the habit of earthly hunger often held her, and he tried to appease it by giving her the softer substance which we know here. Gradually, she became weaned altogether from the earth and the habits of the earth, only going back occasionally in a dream to her father and mother. Do not disregard your dreams about the dead. 
they always mean something. They do not always mean what the dream would seem to signify, for the door between the two worlds is very narrow and thoughts are often shaken out of place in passing through. But dreams about the dead mean something. We can reach you in that way. I came to you in a dream the other night, standing behind the outside of the gate of a walled garden in which you were enclosed. I smiled and beckoned you to come out to me, but I did not wish you to come out to stay. I only meant that you should come out in spirit, for if you come out occasionally, it is easier for me to go into your world. Good night. Letter 20. The Man Who Found God There seems to be no way in which I can better teach you about this life so strange to you than by telling my experiences and conversations with men and women here. I said one night not long ago that I had met more saints than philosophers, and I want to tell you now about a man who seems to be a genuine saint. Yes, there are little saints and great saints, as there are little and great sinners. One day I was walking on a mountaintop. I say, walking, for it seemed about the same, though it takes but little energy to walk here. On the mountaintop I saw a man standing alone. He was looking out and far away, but I could not see what he was looking at. He was abstracted and communing with himself, or with some presence of which I was unaware. I waited for some time. At last, drawing a long breath, for we breathe here, he turned his eyes to me and said with a kind smile, can I do anything for you, brother? I was embarrassed for a moment, feeling that I might have intruded upon some sweet communion. If I'm not too bold in asking, I said, would you tell me what you were thinking as you stood there looking into space? I was conscious of my presumption, but being so determined to learn what can be known, if sometimes I am too bold in making inquiries, I feel that my very earnestness may win for me the forgiveness of those I question. This man had a beautiful beardless face and young-looking eyes but his garments were the ordinary garments of one who thinks little or nothing of his appearance. That very unconsciousness of the outer form may sometimes give it a peculiar majesty. He looked at me in silence for a moment, then he said, I was trying to draw near to God. And what is God, I asked. And where is God? He smiled. I never saw a smile like this as he answered, God is everywhere. God is. What is he, I persisted, and again he repeated, but with a different emphasis, God is. What do you mean, I asked. God is. God is, he said. I do not know how his meaning was conveyed to me, perhaps by sympathy. But it suddenly flashed into my mind that when he said God is, he expressed the completest realization of God which is possible to the spirit. And when he said God is, he meant me to understand that there was no being, nothing that is, except God. There must have been in my face a reflection of what I felt, for the saint then said to me, Do you not also know that he is, and that all that is, is he? I'm beginning to feel what you mean, I answered, though I doubtless feel but a little of it. He smiled and made no reply, but my mind was full of questions. When you were on earth, he said, did you think much about God? Always, I thought of little else. I sought him everywhere, but seemed only at times to get flashes of consciousness as to what he really was. Sometimes when praying, for I prayed much, there would come to me suddenly the question, to what are you praying? And I would answer aloud, to God, to God. But though I prayed to him every day for years, only occasionally did I get a flash of that true consciousness of God. Finally, one day when I was alone in the woods, there came the great revelation. It came not in any form of words, but rather in a wordless and formless wonder, too vast for the limitation of thought. I fell upon the ground and must have lost consciousness, for after a while, how long a time I do not know, I awoke and got up and looked about me. Then gradually I remembered the experience which had been too big for me while I was feeling it. I could put into the form of words the realization which had been too much for my mortality to bear, and the words I used myself were, all that is, is God. It seemed very simple, yet it was far from simple. All that is, is God. That must include me and all my fellow beings, human and animal. Even the trees and the birds and the rivers must be a part of God if God were all that is. From that moment, life assumed a new meaning for me. I could not see a human face without remembering the revelation that that human being I saw was a part of God. When my dog looked at me, I said to him aloud, you are a part of God. When I stood beside a river and listened to the sound of its waters, I said to myself, I am listening to the voice of God. When a fellow being was angry with me, I asked myself, in what way have I offended God? When one spoke lovingly to me, I said, God is loving me now. And the realization nearly took my breath away. Life became unbelievably beautiful. Therefore, I had been so absorbed in God and trying to find God that I had not given much thought to my fellow beings, and had even neglected those nearest me. But from that day, I began to mingle with my human brethren. I found that as more and more I sought God in them, more and more God responded to me through them, and life became still more wonderful. 
Sometimes I tried to tell others what I felt, but they did not always understand me. It was thus I began to realize that God had purposely, and for some reason of his own, covered himself with veils. Was it that he might have the pleasure of tearing them away? If so, I would help him all I could. So I tried to make other men grasp the knowledge of God which I myself had attained. For years I taught men. At first I wanted to teach everybody, but soon I came to see that that was impossible, and so I selected a few who called themselves my disciples. They did not always tell the world that they were my disciples because I asked them not to do so, but I urged each of them to give to someone as much as possible of the knowledge that I had given to him, and so I think that many have come to feel a little of the wonder which was revealed to me that day alone in the woods when I woke to the knowledge that God is, God is. Then the saint turned and left me with all my questions unanswered. I wanted to ask him when and how he had left the earth, and what work he was doing out here, but he was gone. Perhaps I shall see him again some day, but whether I do or not, he has given me something which I in turn give to you as he himself desired to give it to the world. That is all for tonight. Letter 21. The Leisure of the Soul. One of the joys of being here is the leisure for dreaming and for getting acquainted with oneself. Of course, there is plenty to do. But though I intend to go back to the world in a few years, I feel that there is time to get acquainted with myself. I tried to do that on earth more or less. But here there are fewer demands on me. The mere labor of dressing and undressing is lighter and I do not have to earn my living now, nor anybody else's. You too could take time to loaf if you thought you could. You can do practically anything you think you can do. I propose, for instance, in a few years not only to pick up a general knowledge of the conditions of this four-dimensional world, but to go back over my other lives and assimilate what I learned in them. I want to make a synthesis of the complete experiences of my ego up to this date and to judge from that synthesis what I can do in the future with least resistance. I believe, but I'm not quite sure, that I can bring back much of this knowledge with me when I am born again. I shall try to tell you, or some of you, when and about where to look for me again. Oh, don't be startled. It will not be for some time yet. An early date would necessitate hurry, and I do not wish to hurry. I could probably force the coming back, but that would be unwise, for I should then come back with less power than I want. Action and reaction being opposite and equal in the unit or ego being able to generate only so much energy in a given time, it is better for me to rest in this condition of light matter until I have accumulated energy enough to come back with power. I shall not do, however, as many souls do. They stay out here until they are as tired of this world as they formerly were tired of the earth, and then are driven back half unconsciously by the irresistible force of the tide of rhythm. I want to guide that rhythm. Since I have been here, one man whom I know has gone back to the earth. He was about ready to go when I first found him. The strange part of it was that he himself did not understand his condition. He complained of being tired of things and of wanting to rest much. That was probably a natural instinct for rest in preparation for the supreme effort of opening the door of matter again. It is easy to come out here, but it requires some effort to go from this world into yours. I know where that soul is now, for the teacher told me. I had spoken to the teacher about him, but he already knew of his existence. It was rather strange, for the man was one in whom I should have fancied that the teacher would have taken little interest. But one never knows. Perhaps in his next life he may really begin to study the philosophy which they teach. But I was speaking of the larger leisure out here. I wish you could arrange your life so as to have a little more leisure. I do not want you to be lazy, but the passive conditions of the mind are quite as valuable as the active conditions. It is when you are passive that we can teach you. When your mind and body are always occupied, it is difficult to impress you with any message of the soul. Find a little more time each day for doing nothing at all. It is good to do nothing sometimes. Then the semi-conscious parts of your mind can work. They can remind you that there is an inner life. For the inner life that is capable to you on earth is really the point of contact with the world in which we live. I have said that the two worlds touch, and they touch through the inner. You go in to come out. It is a paradox, and paradoxes conceal great truths. Contradictions are not truths, but paradox is not a contradiction. There is a great difference in the length of time that people stay out here. You talk of being homesick. There are souls here who are homesick for the earth. They sometimes go back almost at once, which is generally a mistake. Unless one is young and still has a store of unused energy saved over from the last life, in going back to the earth too soon one lacks the force of a strong rebound. It is strange to see a man here who is homesick for the earth as certain poets and dreamers on earth are homesick for the inner life. This use of the terms outer and inner may seem confusing, but you must remember that while you go in to come to us, we go out to come to you. 
In our normal state here, we are living almost a subjective life. We become more and more objective as we touch your world. You become more and more subjective as you touch our world. If you only knew it, you could come to us at almost any time for a brief visit. I mean by going deep enough into yourself. If you want to try the experiment and will not be afraid, I can take you out here without your quite losing consciousness in your body. I mean without your being in deep sleep. You can call me when you want to make a trial. If I do not come at once, do not be discouraged. Of course, at the moment I might be doing something else. But in that case, I will come at another time. There is no hurry. That is what I want to impress upon you. What you do not do this year, you can perhaps do next year. If you are always rushing after things, you can accomplish little in this particular work. Eternity is long enough for the full development of the ego of man. Eternity seems to have been designed for that end. That was a sound statement which was given at one time. The object of life is life. I have realized that more fully since I have had opportunity to study eternity from a new angle. This is a very good angle from which to view both time and eternity. I see now what I did not see before, and I myself have never wasted any time. Even my failures were a valuable part of my experience. We lose to gain again. We go in and out of power sometimes as we go in and out of life, to learn what is there and outside. In this, as in all things, the object of life is life. Do not hurry. A man may grow gradually in power and knowledge, or he may take them by force. Will is free, but the gradual growth has a less powerful reaction. Letter 22. The Serpent of Eternity. I want to talk to you tonight about eternity. Until I came out, I never had a grasp on that problem. I thought only in terms of months and years and centuries. Now I see the full sweep of the circle. The comings out and goings into matter are no more than the systole and diastole of the ego heart, and speaking from a standpoint of eternity, they are relatively as brief. To you, a lifetime is a long time. It used to seem so to me, but it does not seem so now. People are always saying, if I had my life to live over, I would do so and so. Now, no man has any particular life to live over any more than the heart can go back and beat over again the beat of the second previous but every man has his next life to prepare for. Suppose you have made a botch of your existence. Most men have, viewed from the standpoint of their highest ideal. But every man who can think must have assimilated some experience which he can carry over with him. He may not, on coming out into the sunlight of another life on earth, be able to remember the details of his former experience, though some men can recall them by a sufficient training and a fixed will. But the tendencies of any given life, the unexplained impulses and desires, are in nearly all cases brought over. You should get away from the mental habit of regarding your present life as the only one. Get rid of the idea that the life you expect to lead on this side after your death is to be an endless existence in one state. You could no more endure such an endless existence in the subtle matter of the inner world than you could endure to live forever in the gross matter in which you are now encased. You would weary of it. You could not support it. Do get this idea of rhythm into your brain. All beings are subject to the law of rhythm, even the gods though in a greater way than ourselves, with longer periods of flux and reflux. I did not want to leave the earth. I fought against it until the last. But now I see that my coming out was inevitable because of the conditions. Had I begun earlier, I might have provisioned my craft for a longer cruise. But when the coal and water had run out, I had to make port. It is possible to provision even a small life craft for a longer voyage than the allotted three score and ten. But one must economize coal and not waste water. There are some who will understand that water is the fluid of life. Many persons resent the idea that the life after death is not eternal, a never-ending progression in spiritual realms, though few who so object have much of an idea what they mean when they talk of spiritual realms. Life everlasting is possible to all souls, yes, but it is not possible to go on forever in one direction. Evolution is a curve. Eternity is a circle, a serpent that swallows its own tail. Until you are willing to go in and out of dense matter, you will never learn to transcend matter. There are those who can stay in or out at will and relatively speaking as long as they choose. But they are never those who shrink from either form of life. I used to shrink from what I called death. There are those on this side who shrink from what they call death. Do you know what they call death? It is rebirth into the world. Yes, even so. There are many here who are as ignorant of rhythm as most people are on your side. I have met men and women who did not even know that they would go back to the earth again, who talked of the great change as the men of earth talk of dying, and of all that lay beyond the unproved and unprovable. It would be tragic if it were not so absurd. 
when I knew that I had to die, I determined to carry with me memory, philosophy, and reason. Now I want to say something which will perhaps surprise you. There is a man who wrote a book called The Law of Psychic Phenomena, and in that book he said certain things of two parts of the mind which he called the subjective and the objective. He said that the subjective mind was incapable of inductive reasoning, that the subjective mind would accept any premise given it by the objective mind, and would reason from that premise with matchless logic, but that it could not go behind the premise, that it could not reason backwards. Now, remember that in the form of matter where I am, men are living principally a subjective life, as men on earth live principally an objective life. These people here, being in the subjective, reason from the premises already given them during their objective or earth existence. That is why most of those who have lived in the so-called western lands where the idea of rhythm or rebirth is unpopular came out here with the fixed idea that they would not go back into the earth life. Hence most of them still reason from that premise. Do you not understand that what you believe you are going to be out here is largely determinative of what you will be? Those who do not believe in rebirth cannot forever escape the rhythm of rebirth, but they hold to their belief until the tide of rhythm sweeps them along with it and forces them into gross matter again into which they go quite unprepared, carrying with them almost no memory of their life out here. They carried out here the memory of the earth life because they expected so to carry it. Many Orientals who have always believed in rebirth remember their former lives because they expected to remember them. Yes, when I realized that I had to leave the earth, I laid a spell upon myself. I determined to remember through both the going out and the subsequent coming in. Of course, I cannot swear now to remember everything when I came into heavy matter again but I am determined to do so if possible, and I shall succeed to some extent if I do not get the wrong mother. I intend to take great care on that point and to choose a mother who is familiar with the idea of rebirth. If possible, I want to choose a mother who actually knew me in my last life as blank and who, if I shall announce in childhood that I am that same blank whom she knew as a young girl, will not chide me and drive me back into myself with her doubts. I believe that many children carry over into earth life memories of their lives out here, but that those memories are afterwards lost by reason of the suggestion constantly given to children that they are newly created, fresh from the hand of God, etc., etc. Eternity is indeed long, and there are more things on earth and heaven than are dreamed of in the philosophy of the average teacher of children. If you could only get hold of the idea of immortal life and cling to it, if you could realize yourself as being without beginning and without end, then you might commence to do things worthwhile. It is a wonderful consciousness, that consciousness of eternity. Small troubles seem indeed small to him who thinks of himself in the terms of a million years. You may take the figure a billion or whatever you like, but the idea is the same. No man can grasp the idea of a million years or a million dollars or a million of anything. The figure is merely a symbol for a great quantity, whether it be years or gold pieces. The idea cannot be fixed. There will always be something that escapes. No millionaire knows exactly what he is worth at any given time for there is always interest to be counted, and the value is a shifting one. It is so with immortality. Do not think of yourself as having lived a million years or a trillion years, but as truly immortal without beginning or end. The man who knows himself to be rich is richer than the man who says that he has a certain amount of money, be the amount large or small. So rest in the consciousness of eternity and work in the consciousness of eternity. That is all for tonight. Letter 23. A Brief for the Defendant. Tell the friend who was so anxious lest I do you harm by writing with your hand that that matter was thoroughly threshed out on this side between the master and me before it began to take form on your side. Ordinary mediumship, where the organism of a more or less unhealthy person on earth is opened indiscriminately for the entrance and obsession of any passing spirit, good or evil, is a very different proposition from this. Here I, who was your friend in the world, having passed beyond, reach back to instruct you from my greater knowledge on this side. I am not making any opening in your nervous system through which irresponsible and evil forces can enter and take possession of you. In fact, if any spirit, good or bad, should make such an attempt, he would have to reckon with me, and I am not powerless. I know now, have both remembered and been taught secrets by which I can protect you from what is generally known as mediumship. Furthermore, I advise you, even at the urgent prayer of those whose loved ones have gone out, never to lend yourself to them. The wanderers in the so-called invisible world have no right to come and demand entrance through your organism merely because it is so constituted that they could enter, any more than a street crowd would have the right to force its way into your home merely because its members were curious, hungry, or cold. Do not allow it. Permission was once given, yes, but the case was exceptional and was not based on the personal desire or curiosity of anybody, not even yourself. I doubt if permission will ever be granted again. Many things have changed since I began to write with you. 
At first I used her hand and arm from the outside, sometimes as you remember with such force as to make them lame the next day. Then grown more familiar with the means at my disposal I tried another method and you noticed a change in the character of the writing. It began clumsily with large and badly formed letters gradually becoming clear as my control of the instrument I was using was better established. Now for the last few times I've used still another and a third method. I enter your mind, putting myself in absolute telepathic rapport with your mind, impressing upon your mind itself the things I wish to say. In order to write in this way, you have to make yourself utterly passive, stilling all individual thought and yielding yourself to my thought. But that is no more than you do every day in reading a fascinating book. You give your mind to the author who leads you along, wrapped in passive by means of the printed page. These experiments in perfecting a way of communication have been very interesting to me. Tell your friend that I am not a child nor a reckless experimentalist. Not only in my last life on earth, but in many former lives, I have been a student of the higher science, giving myself absolutely to truth and to the quest of truth. I have never wantonly used any human being to his or her detriment, and I certainly shall not begin with you, my true friend and student, nor shall I interfere in any way with your life or with your studies and work. The idea is nonsensical. While I walked the world on two feet, I was never considered a dangerous man. I have not changed my character merely by changing my clothes and putting on a lighter suit. I have certain things to say to the world. At present, you are the only person who can act as a manuensis for me. This is neither my fault nor yours. The question before us is not whether I want the letters written, or even whether you want to write them, but whether they will be beneficial to the world. I think they will. You think they may be. B thinks that they are not only immensely valuable, but unique. So and so and so and so have doubts and fears. I cannot help that, nor can you. Bless their hearts. Why should they be so anxious to bolt the doors behind me? I shall certainly not try to run their affairs for them from this side. They are equal to their job, or they would not be able to hold it. But this is quite a different job which I have given myself, and you have kindly consented to help me. You may not get much reward for your labor, save the shake of the wiseacres' heads and their superior smiles, and the suggestion of the more scientifically inclined that I am your own subconscious mind. I shall not be offended by that hypothesis, nor need you. Of course you are not worried, for if you were I could not write. Your mind has to be placid as a lake on a windless night in order for me to write at all. Give my love to them. Letter 24 Forbidden Knowledge I have been doing many things of late. You could never imagine where I went the other day, to the great funeral of the Emperor of Japan. You could not go from Paris to Japan and return in so short a time, could you? But I did. An hour before starting I did not even know that the Emperor of Japan was dead. The teacher sought me out and invited me to go with him. He said that something would occur there which I ought to see. His prophecy was verified. I saw a soul, a great soul, go out as a suicide. It was sad and terrible. But as I write this, the teacher comes and stands beside me. He advises me to say no more on that subject. One sees horrible things out here as well as beautiful things. I could only say with regard to suicide that if men knew what awaits those who go out by their own hand, they would remain with the evil that they know. I am sorry I cannot tell you more about this, for it would interest you. The testimony of an eyewitness is always more convincing than the mere repetition of theories. The appearance of the teacher with his advice has put out of my mind for the moment the desire to write, but I will come again. Later. I have been able to do what you so much desired, to find the boy who came accidentally by drowning. As you looked at his photograph, I saw it through your eyes and carried away the memory of the face. I found him wandering about, quite bewildered. When I spoke to him of you and said that you would ask me to help him, he seemed surprised. I was able to give him a little aid, though he has a friend here, an old man who was nearer to him than I could ever be. He will gradually adjust himself to the new conditions. You would better not try to speak with him. He is on a different path and is being looked after for he has friends. The little help I was able to give was in the nature of information. He needed diversion from a too pressing thought and I suggested one or two ways of passing time which are both agreeable and instructive. You wonder at the expression, passing time. But time exists out here. Wherever there is sequence, there is time. There may come a time when all things will exist simultaneously, past, present, and shall we say future. But so long as past, present, and future are more or less distinct, so long time is. It is nothing but the principle of sequence. Did you fancy it was anything else? Interiorly, that is deep within the self, one may find a silent place where all things seem to exist in unison. But as soon as the soul even there attempts to examine things separately, then sequence begins. The union with the all is another matter. That is or seems to be timeless. 
but as soon as one attempts to unite with or be conscious of things, time is manifest. Letter 25. A Shadowless World I'd been here some time before I noticed one of the most marked peculiarities of this world. One night as I was passing slowly along, I saw a group of persons approaching me. It was very light where they were because there were so many of them. Suddenly as I saw this light, a thought came to my mind. A saying from one of the hermetic books, Where the light is strongest, there are the shadows deepest. But on looking at these men and women, I saw that they cast no shadows. I hailed the nearest man. You must remember that this was soon after I came out and when I was still more ignorant than I am now. And I called his attention to this peculiar phenomenon of a shadowless yet brilliantly lighted world. He smiled at my surprise and said, You have not been here long, have you? No. Then you are not aware that we light our own place. The substance of which our bodies are composed is radiant. How could our forms cast shadows when light radiates from them in all directions? And in the sunlight, I asked, Oh, he answered, you know that in the sunlight we cannot be seen at all. The light of the sun is coarse and crude, and it puts out the light of the spirits. Does it seem strange to you that at this moment I can feel the warmth of the wood fire by which you sit? There is a magic in burning wood. The combustion of coal has quite a different effect upon the psychic atmosphere. If one who had always been blind to visions and insensible to the finer feelings and premonitions of the invisible world would try meditating before a blazing wood fire for an hour or two every day or night, his eyes and subtler senses might be open to things of which he had theretofore never even dreamed. Those Orientals who worship their gods with fire are wise and full of visions. The light of burning wax is also a magical effect, though different from that of a wood fire. Sit in the evening with no light but that of a solitary candle and see what visions will come from the void. I have not told you anything for a long time about the boy Lionel. He is now much interested in the idea of choosing a family of engineers in which to be born again. The thought is one to which he is always returning. Why are you in such a hurry to leave me, I asked him, the first time he mentioned the subject. But I do not feel as if I should be leaving you altogether, he replied. I could come out to you in dreams. Not at first, I told him. You would be prisoned and blind and deaf for a long time, and you might not be able to come out to me here until after I had also gone back again to the earth. Then why not come along with me, he asked. Say, father, why shouldn't we be born as twins? The idea was so absurd I laughed heartily. But Lionel could not see where the joke came in. There are such things as twins, he said seriously. I knew a pair of twin brothers when I lived in Boston. But when I return to Earth, it is no part of my plan to be anybody's twin. So I tell Lionel that if he wants to enjoy my society for a time, he will have to stay quietly where he is. But why can't we go back together, he still asks, and be cousins or neighbors at least. Perhaps we can, I tell him, if you do not spoil everything by an unseemly haste. It is strange about this boy. Out in this world, there is boundless opportunity to work in subtle matter, opportunity to invent an experiment, yet he wants to get his hands on iron and steel. Strange. Some night I will try to bring the boy to pay you a visit so that you can see him. I mean just before you fall asleep. Those are the true visions. The ones which come in sleep are apt to be confused by the jarring of the matter through which you pass in waking. Do not forget the boy. I have already told him how I come in right with your hand and he is much interested. Why couldn't I operate a telegraph in that way, he asked me. But I advised him not to try it. He might interrupt some terrestrial message which had been sent and paid for. Occasionally, I take him with me up to the pattern world. He has a little model of his own there with which he amuses himself while I am examining other things. It is the model of a wheel, and he sets it going by the electricity of his fingers. No, it is not made of steel. Not as you know steel. Why, what you call steel is too heavy. It would fall through this world so fast that it would not even leave a rent behind it. You must understand that the two worlds are composed of matter not only moving at a different rate of vibration, but charged with a different magnetism. It is said that two solid objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. But that law does not apply to two objects, one of them belonging to your world and the other to ours. As water can be hot and wet at the same time, so a square foot of space can contain a square foot of earthly matter and a square foot of etheric matter. No, do not quibble about terms. You have no terms for the kind of matter that we use here because you do not know anything about it. Lionel and his electric wheel would both be invisible to you if they were set down on the hearth rug before you at this moment. Even the magic of that wood fire would not make them visible, at least not in the daylight. Some evening, uh, but we will speak of that at another time. I must go now. Letter 26. Circles in the Sand. I'm just beginning to enjoy the romance of life out here. I must always have had the romantic temperament, but only since changing my place have I had time and opportunity to give rein to it. 
On Earth, there was always too much to be done, too many duties, too many demands on me. Here, I am free. You have no idea of the meaning of freedom unless you can remember when you were out here last, and I doubt if you can remember that yet. When I say romance, I mean the charm of existence, the magic touch which turns the gray face of life to rose color. You know what I mean. It is wonderful to have leisure to dream and to realize one's dream, for here the realization goes with the dream. Everything is so real, imagination is so potent, and the power to link things is so great, so almost unlimited. The dreamers here are really not idle, for our dreaming is a kind of building. And even if it were not, we have a right to do about as we please. We have earned our vacation. The labor will come again. We shall reclothe ourselves in gross matter and take on its burdens. Why, it takes more energy on earth to put one heavy foot before another heavy foot and to propel the hundred or two hundred pound body a mile than it takes here to go around the world. That will give you an idea of the quantity of surplus energy that we have for enjoying ourselves and for dream building. Perhaps on earth you work too much, more than is really necessary. The massive needless things that you accumulate around you, the artificial wants that you create, the breakneck pace of your lives to provide all these things seems to us absurd and rather pitiful. Your political economy is mere child's play. Your governments are cumbrous machines for doing the unnecessary. Most of your work is useless, and your lives would be nearly futile if you did not suffer so much that your souls learn, though unwillingly, that most of their strivings are vain. How I used to sweat and groan in the early days to make my little circle in the sand. And now I see that if I had taken more time to think, I might have recovered something of my past knowledge gained in other lives. And though I still had felt obliged to draw my circle in the sand, I might have done it with less difficulty and in half the time. Here, if I choose, I can spend hours in watching the changing colors of a cloud. Or better still, I can lie on my back and remember. It is wonderful to remember, to let the mind go back year after year, life after life, century after century, back and back till one finds oneself, a turtle. But one can also look ahead, forward and forward, life after life, century after century, eon after eon, till one finds oneself an archangel. The looking back is memory. The looking forward is creation. Of course, we create our own future. Who else could do it? We are influenced and moved and shifted and helped or retarded by others. But it is we ourselves who forge the chains every time. We tie knots that we shall have to untie, often with labor and perplexity. In going back over my past lives, I realized the why and the wherefore of my last one. It was, in a way, the least satisfactory of many lives, save one. But now I see its purpose, and that I laid the plans for it when I was last out here. I even arranged to go back to Earth at a definite time in order to be with certain friends who met me there. But I've turned the corner now, and have begun the upward march again. Already I'm laying the lines for my next coming, though there is no hurry. Bless you, I am not going back until I've had my fill of the freedom and enjoyment of this existence here. Also, I have much studying to do. I want to review what I've learned in those hitherto forgotten but now remembered lives. Do you recall how when you went to school you had occasionally to review the lessons of the preceding weeks or months? That custom is based on the sound principle. I am now having my review lessons. By and by, before I return to the world, I shall review these reviews, fixing by will the memories which I specially wish to carry over with me. It would be practically impossible to carry over intact the great panorama of experience which now enrolls itself before the eyes of my memory. But there are several fundamental things, philosophical principles and illustrations, which I must not forget. Also, I want to take with me the knowledge of certain formulae and the habit of certain practices which you would probably call a cult, by means of which, when I am mature again in my new body, I can call into memory this very pageant of experience which now rolls before me whenever I will it. No, I am not going to tell you about your own past. You must and can recover it for yourself. So can anyone who knows the difference between memory and imagination. Yes, the difference is subtle, but as real as the difference between yesterday and tomorrow. I do not want you to be in any hurry about coming out here to stay. Remain where you are just as long as possible. Much that we do on this side you can do almost as well while still in the body. Of course you have to use more energy, but that is what energy is for, to use. Even when we store it, we store it for future use. Do not forget that. One reason why I rest so much now and dream and amuse myself is because I want to store as much energy as possible to come back with power. It is well that you have taken my advice to idle a little and to get acquainted with your own soul. There are surprises in store for the person who will deliberately set out on the quest of his soul. The soul is not a will of the wisp. It is a beacon of light to steer by and avoid the rocks of materialism and forgetfulness. I have had much joy in going back over my Greek incarnations. What concentration they had, those Greeks. They knew much. The waters of Lethe, for instance. 
What a conception, brought from this side by masterly memory. If man would even try to remember, if he would only take time to consider all that he has been, there would be more hope of what he may become. Why, do you know that man may become a god, or that which compared with ordinary humanity has all the magnitude and grandeur of a god? Ye are gods was not said in a merely figurative sense. I have met the master from Galilee and have held communion with him. There was a man and a god. The world has need of him now. Letter 27. The Magic Ring. It would be hard for you to understand merely by my telling you the difference between your life and ours. Begin with the difference in substance, not only the substance of our bodies, but the substance of natural objects which surround us. Do you start at the term natural objects as applied to the things of this world? You did not fancy, did you, that we had escaped nature? No one escapes nature, not even God. Nature is. Imagine that you had spent 60 or 70 years in a heavy earthly body, a body which insisted on growing fat and would get stiff-jointed and rheumatic, even going on strike occasionally to the extent of laying you up in bed for repairs of a more or less clumsy sort. Then fancy yourself suddenly exchanging this heavy body for a light and elastic form. Can you imagine it? I confess that it would have been difficult for me even a year or two ago. Clothed in this form which is sufficiently radiant to light its own place when its light is not put out by the cruder light of the sun, fancy yourself moving from place to place, from person to person, from idea to idea. As time goes on, even the habit of demanding nourishment gradually wears off. We are no longer bothered by hunger and thirst. Though I, for instance, still stay myself occasionally with a little nourishment, an infinitesimal amount compared with the beefsteak dinners which I used to eat, and we are no longer harassed by the thousand and one petty duties of the earth. Out here we have more confidence in moods. Engagements are seldom made, that is, binding engagements. As a rule, though there are exceptions, desire is mutual. I want to see and commune with a friend at the same time when he feels a desire for my society and we naturally drift together. The companionships here are very beautiful, but the solitudes are also full of charm. Since the first two or three months I have not been lonesome. At first I felt like a fish out of water, of course. Nearly everyone does though there are exceptions in the case of very spiritual people who have no earthly ties or ambitions. I had so fought the idea of dying that my new state seemed at first to be the proof of my failure, and I used to wander about under the impression that I was going to waste much valuable time which could have been used to better advantage in the storm and stress of earthly living. Of course, the teacher came to me, but he was too wise to carry me on his back even from the first. He reminded me of a few principles which he left me to apply and gradually as I got hold of the application I got hold of myself. Then also gradually the beauty and wonder of the new condition began to dawn on me and I saw that instead of wasting time I was really gaining tremendous experience which could be utilized later. I have talked with many people here, people of all stages of intellectual and moral growth and I am sorry to say that the person who has a clear idea of the significance of life and its possibilities for development is about as rare here as on the earth. As I have said before, a man does not suddenly become all wise by changing the texture of his body. The vain man on earth is likely to be vain here, though in his next life the very law of reaction, if he has overdone vanity, may send him back as a modest or even bashful person, for a while at least, until the reaction has spent itself. In coming out, a man brings his character and characteristics with him. I have often been sorry for men who in life have been slaves of the business routine. Many of them cannot get away from it for a long time and instead of enjoying themselves here, they go back and forth to and from the scenes of their old labors, working over and over some problem in tactics or finance until they are almost as weary as when they died. As you know, there are teachers here. Few of them are of the stature of my own teacher, but there are many who make it their pleasure to help the souls of the newly arrived. They never leave a newcomer entirely to his own resources. Help is always offered, though it is not always accepted. In that case, it will be offered again and again, for those who give themselves to others do so without hope of reward or even acknowledgement. If I had set out to write a scientific treatise of the life on this side, I should have begun in quite a different way from this. In the first place, I should have postponed the labor about ten years, until all my facts were pigeonholed and docketed. Then I should have begun at the beginning and dictated a book so dull that you would have fallen asleep over it, and I should have had to nudge you from time to time to pick up the pencil fallen from your somnolent hand. Instead, I began to write soon after coming out, and these letters are really the letters of a traveler in a strange country. They record his impressions, often his mistakes, sometimes his provincial prejudices, but at least they are not a rehash of what somebody else has said. I like your keeping my photograph on your mantle as you do. It helps me to come. There is a great power in a photograph. 
I have been drawing pictures for you lately on the canvas of dreams to show you the futility and vanity of certain things. Did you not know that we could do that? The power of the so-called dead to influence the living is immense, provided that the tie of sympathy has been made. I have taught you how to protect yourself against influences which you do not want, so do not be afraid. I will always stand guard to the extent of warning you if there is any danger of attack from this side. Already I have drawn a magic ring around you which only the most advanced and powerful spirits could pass, even if they desired. That is, the teachers and I drew it together. You are doing our work just now and have a right to our protection. That the laborer is worthy of his hire is an axiom of both worlds. Only you yourself could let down the bars for the inrush of evil and irresponsible spiritual intelligences. And if you should inadvertently let down the bars, we should rush to put them up again. We have some authority out here. Yes, even so soon I can say that. Are you surprised? You've been listening to Classic Paranormal's reading of Letters from a Living Dead Man by Elsa Barker. This was the second installment. Be sure to click into the succeeding episodes until the book is complete. Until then, followers of the freaky, aficionados of the afterworldly, connoisseurs of the creepy, stay spooky. Before you go, consider subscribing to my new podcast, Classic Paranormal. It's a clearinghouse for lost real-life accounts of true ghost stories. It's found on Apple Podcasts. Go there now if you're interested in enigmatic tales, chilling true accounts, chronicles from cases of the past that time has forgotten, but that the modern person who likes relaxing by a campfire swapping ghost stories might appreciate. As I said, the new podcast I'm launching is available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify, and there's a link in the description below on this video.